Well, I've got the tutorials here pulled up and I'm going to go ahead and start with some of the core concepts in the basic modeling tutorials. Now, the model that we're about to make isn't going to be highly refined. It's not going to be as good as the one on the Ground School website because we don't have the kind of time to nitpick all the fiddly bits of skinning and what have you. But what I am going to show you is how you can pull out some reference dimensions and how you can start to place things together in a way that makes sense for your model. So what we're going to do is take a quick look at what the aircraft would eventually look like here. Now if we fit this to screen, this just happens to be an example uh, transport aircraft that we pulled from online and publicly available information. So uh, you can do measurements and you can match it. And you know, it's an okay model. It's not perfect, it's certainly not to the CAD level, but for an open VSP model, this one isn't too bad. So what we're going to do is just make a new model and start looking at how you would even begin to model something like this. And usually a great place to start is to find some publicly available information on the layout of your aircraft. Now in this case, I've pulled out a three-view drawing of the aircraft, and in Adobe Reader, you have a measuring tool where you can click and drag and figure out measurements as long as everything is set to scale. Now the way that you can do that is when you open it up, you go to your tools and a measure tool. You actually have to turn this on and then you have various types and you'll get this crosshair. So if we were to click at this measurement point and drag this over and you can hold shift, you can see that we can get something pretty close to what's documented. Now the reason that's already coming out this way is because I've set the scale. So if we right click out here, you can say change scale ratio and precision. And you can see that my scale ratio is currently the measured three inches that it'll show you the first time you do this on your page. And you can set it to the dimension that you want. Now this is going to have a certain precision that you have. And you can start to use this three view drawing to pull out dimensions in your model. So this is a really great place to begin. Another really nice thing that we can do if we go back to our VSP model is we can go to a window and background and we can pick an image. So let's say we want to start with a top view. Okay, this isn't too bad. We have a nice outline of the fuselage. We've got our wing, our engines, our tails, everything's laid out for us. And if we want, we can add different background views. So before we even add a component, I want to give a quick word on how you can interact with your workspace in a way that makes it very effective. So if you need to, you can scale these and make them bigger or smaller. If you happen to find that perhaps the image itself is not using the correct dimensions in one or the other because either it didn't come into the PDF correctly or a dimension is wrong, you can also give a different scale in width and height. Now, if you go to window, you can see that you have the option of one workspace or four, two, and two. If you break this up into four workspaces, and we have all of these here, notice that everything cleared out, but this red box designates your active window. If you click image, it's now going to put one image here. You can click image, and we can set this one, let's say, to a side view. Okay, we're happy there. Let's do this one we want to do a front view. So you can see that the scale is a little bit different here because it got a hold of the background and it kind of smashed it because I told it to not preserve the aspect. We can fix that stuff later, but the point is that for each one of these active workspaces, you have control as if it was its own workspace. So in this first, let's go ahead and add a fuselage component and we're going to jump to a top view and try and line this up. Now, based on our model here, we know that our fuselage length is 124 feet and 9 inches. Okay, that's all well and good. Let's go to our fuselage design. We're going to say 124 feet plus 9 by 12 because you can do smart input math in the parameters now. Press enter and you have it the correct size. And now we can start to line this up as needed 
And then we can start playing around with cross sections because now we know one dimension lines up with the view that we want. We can start pushing cross sections around. We can start shaping it by hand if we want. So since I've shown you how to manipulate these in a four window scheme, let's go ahead and go back to a single window. And now we can kind of see a little bit more detail of what's going on. So I am going to try and do this with my mouse, but let's say it doesn't like me very well and it's a little clunky. You can always go to view adjust and you can take your zoom, collapse this down a little bit, and you can get some nice fine zoom control over this part and line it up just where you want to. Okay. So at this point, let's go ahead and get rid of adjust view, go to the cross section window and start to play with a few of these. So I'm going to start adjusting the width. And the nice thing is the width is given to me. It's 12 feet, four inches. So I can just simply say 12.3333 and we're good. Go to the next one or even copy and paste. Okay. We're going to paste again. So now we have a nice width. We can play around with some of the skinning to get things to line up, but we're starting to get there. So next let's go ahead and change the background to a side view. And we're going to line this up again. We're going to jump to a left hand view, set things up, maybe give it a little bit of zoom to try and line these things up. And we're just going to continue on. So if we adjust, we're going to move our zoom around a little bit, get things mostly lined up. And the point here is to just show you about what to do, not to really worry about all the little fiddly things. So we're going to go ahead and move this around. And for each of these cross sections, we're going to start to place where they need to go. So let's say that for this one, we want to set our height. Let's give this a bit of positive Z. That's too open. If you click these little collapsible caret icons to either side of your slider, that's going to collapse the range. So you can see now that this is moving much more slowly than when I originally had it. So now I can do that, give it a bit more height. All right, now we're getting closer and that's about 13 feet. That's not too bad. So let's go ahead and set these to 13 feet as well. Give it some Z. Okay, looking pretty good. All right, so rather than go through all the little details of trying to get the fuselage exactly right, I think by now you get the idea. So we're gonna leave the fuselage and we're gonna start dealing with how to shape a wing. So in this case, what we're going to do is, as a child of the fuselage geometry, you see we have it selected there. We're going to click on wing and we're going to add. And just because we want to, we're going to say that it's attached to this parent in the component location and we're going to leave the rotation alone. So let's go ahead and press F5, jump to a top view, and we're going to adjust our background here and bring up that top view again. So now we've got our model lined up and we can start to think about placing our wing. So as a quick word and a little tip in VSP that if you have a custom view that you really like, say for example, a zoom and a rotation that fits your background exactly the way you want to, you can hold shift and press F1, F2, F3, or F4 and Open VSP is going to remember that camera orientation, including the zoom and the center of reference for you. So you can press F1, F2, F3, F4 and quickly snap back to that preset view. If you have two or four of these workspaces open, you can have up to 16 different saved views because again, each one of those workspaces treats itself as, as if it's its own workspace. Okay, so that's a handy little trick for when you want to jump around and get a nice clean view. So in this case, we're going to go ahead and start moving this wing back to where we think it needs to go. And if we look at our reference drawing, our wingspan from tip to tip should be about 113.6. So that's as measured. In this case, it's saying it's 112 feet 7 inches from tip to tip. So let's use the reference drawing rather than what the measurement on the paper says. So we're going to set our wingspan. Under plan, we're going to say it's 112 feet and 7 inches. Okay, so let's do parenthesis 112 feet plus 7 twelfths, close parenthesis, divided by, oh, 
I apologize. 112 feet plus 7 twelfths for the total span. In the section span, you would have divided that by 2 because it's only dealing with this right-hand side. But we didn't have to do that. We were doing span. So now we can place this about where it needs to go. And obviously, we need a multi-section wing. So let's go here and split. And if we start moving this span back some, now is where we have to start figuring out what the total span needs to be. In this case, let's just eyeball it. That looks good enough. So transform. We're going to move this up. We're going to give this first section a little bit more sweep. And note here, we're controlling the sweep about the zero location. That's the leading edge. We can set this back and control trailing edge sweep if we want to. But for now, let's go ahead and start dragging back. Give this some extra root cord. Perhaps something more like... Oh, it's probably about 26, 27 feet, maybe 25. 25 looks good. Let's do that. And then the tip cord, we can just increase until it looks about right. So maybe 12 and a half. Not too bad. So let's come out to section two. Again, maybe we have a little bit too much sweep. Let's back that off a little bit and give it some tip cord. All right. So in a relatively short time, we have a wing that looks like it has about the same plan form that it's supposed to have based on the three view drawing. So again, note that split gave us that multi-section component. And when we came in, we just gave it a little bit of cord here and there. And maybe it's not exactly accurate because we're eyeballing it, but it, you can see how easy it would be to go in and adjust these parameters to get something very, very close to what's in your measured drawing. So from here, if we want, we can go ahead and further modify this wing. Let's say we want a front view. And again, let's come to our image and go to a front view. And then we can start placing things where we can start to adjust maybe the thickness, give it some dihedral. And, uh, and do that. So here, let's go to the transform tab. We're going to lower this wing just a little bit to maybe there looks pretty good. And if we come out to section two, we can start to give this some dihedral. Now you'll notice that even though I left everything the same, because I jumped to a different view, my zoom changed. So again, kind of like earlier, I need to tweak this zoom so that everything lines up a little bit better. But for the most part, you get the idea that you can set these up, line things up, and then kind of by hand manipulate these models until they get you what you need. So based on the front profile, it looks like our thickness to cord is okay down near the root and at the tip. And if we want to modify things even further, we can come to the airfoil tab and you'll notice that each of these has a NACA 4 series. In this case, we're using a NACA 10 pretty much everywhere. We don't have to do that. You can use any one of these different cross-section types to define this airfoil, or you can set things to an airfoil file. Now, VSP is packaged with airfoil files. You can just come here to airfoils, and here is a nice list of already included airfoils. So let's say we want uh, 737A airfoil, click OK, and if you click show, you can see what that airfoil likes in the cross-section view window. So you'll notice here that this root section got pretty beefy, and really what we need to do would be to drop this down a little bit more, set that other cross-section airfoil to be correct here, and then modify things accordingly as we move out. But that is how you can come in and modify airfoils in a wing and adjust things. If you happen to know, for example, what your root incidence happens to be, you can give this some root incidence. And if we zoom in and perhaps let's just get rid of the background, because at this point, I think you can see how to manipulate these models, how to match things to a background view and use reference dimensions. Let's just see what changing some of these other parameters does for you. And with some time remaining closer to maybe quarter past the hour as we transition to our next, we can go ahead and answer some of these basic modeling questions that you have. But if we go ahead and just jump back to a color and let's no-show the fuselage, 
Notice that when I no-showed the parent, it no-showed everything underneath it. So we can click show on the wing and now we've got it in isolation. If we come back to the plan tab here, you can see that we can give it some positive incidence and all it's doing is rotating about the quarter cord of this airfoil and it's giving it a rotation where the trailing edge is moving downward. So if we happen to know, you know, let's set that to four degrees, why not? That sets the root incidence, but for each section, if we come back here to section one, note that our twist is set to zero degrees in absolute. If you wanted to change this to relative, let's watch what happens. So I'm going to do another little trick. If you go to the view, you might notice that you can do center, set rotation center, or fit on screen. So I'm going to press R and choose that trailing edge point as my center of rotation. Now I can keep that centered and rotate around and see what I want to see, no matter how closely I'm zoomed in. So while I'm doing this, notice that if I go back to absolute, that airfoil goes back to a zero incidence relative to the global frame. If I tell it relative, it's at four degrees and it's zero relative to the previous cross section. So this is an important distinction when you're modeling things like the twist in your wings is, do you want to add some delta twist so that you can prescribe how it moves relative to the root? Or do you want to be able to prescribe it relative to your X direction or wherever your orientation your wing happens to be? Because you can combine things like twist come to transform and give it some rotation about the Y axis and the whole geometry will rotate, but the twist is still the twist. So try and keep that stuff in mind that when you start combining rotations and transformations and things like that, that whatever orientation it is with the free stream direction or with your global X, Y, and Z may be slightly different because you're starting to combine rotations. So because we went ahead and did that with twist, I want you to also notice that dihedral has the same flag. So back here at the root, we've told it that we want zero absolute dihedral out here in the second one, we gave it about five positive. Well, let's change this to relative and note that it turns relative on for the entire wing. You can't pick and choose. It's either relative or it's absolute. So with relative dihedral on, let's see what happens when I start to give the root some dihedral. Notice that the tip, the angle is changing because it's adding that extra bit. If we set this back to zero, turn absolute on, now, if I start to give this extra dihedral, notice that this outboard section keeps its dihedral because it's relative to the absolute frame. Another thing, since we're talking about dihedral that we really need to pay attention to, is you'll see there's this flag that says rotate foil to match dihedral. Now, this is really nice to use, particularly if you're doing something like modifying winglets or trying to put something with a high degree of dihedral and rotation out at the wingtip. So something like a blended wing would benefit from this a lot. But if we turn this on, it's important to note that here at the center, these two, if you're modeling, need to be vertical. So you need to have these things nice and closed. If we were to start to rotate, watch what happens. So because I gave it a lot of dihedral, you can see what's going on here at the root. These two have separated and overlapped. And if you try and run this through VSP Arrow or a different solver, it's not going to like this at all. So the way to get around that, if you do want to rotate your foils to match dihedrals, all you do is you just put in a very short span section here with zero dihedral, and you build off of that. That's going to maintain this center cross section nice and parallel to each other and closed and you can give yourself relative dihedral as you move outboard. So for now, you notice if we turn that off, all of these different cross sections are all vertical and that keeps everything tight. So for small dihedral, the small angle approximation means that everything is probably okay. You're not really changing the thickness all that much. But if you give it a whole lot, notice how the thickness is prescribed here. If we turn this on, it makes the wing thicker. And that's because it's using this perpendicular section here. So bear in mind that the decisions that you make in your model, say if you were using this as a V-tail in your model, it does make a difference to the size of the wing and the thickness of the wing. So pay attention to what you're doing when you're putting this stuff together. And while we're on the subject of how to build a tail, 
Let's go ahead and say that we want to show our model and put a vertical tail in this. So the way that you do that, we're just going to add a wing, we're going to come to transform, and we are going to turn off XZ symmetry, because we don't need this other side. If we rotate about X in the positive direction, using the right hand rule and give that 90 degrees, we now have a nice vertical wing section that we can use as a tail. So in that case, we're just going to take this and drag it way back in X until we're somewhere near the tail. And this is just a piece of the default wing, but we can make it much, much bigger very easily. Let's just give it more span, give it some root and some tip, maybe back off on the sweep a little bit. Okay, so there's your vertical tail. It's as easy as that, but with a vertical tail, remember, don't leave XZ symmetry activated. So if I turn this on or off, you can see it's really hard to see if anything's happening. But what's actually going on, if we back this off a little bit, you can see that there are two coincident surfaces right on top of each other. And that's going to cause all sorts of problems with your solvers or your geometry down the road. With anything that you're trying to make a vertical surface like that, do not reflect about XZ. Now, it's all well and good if you're going to have an offset vertical tail to try and make something like an H tail. Yeah, go ahead. Leave XZ symmetry on. Make sure that it's about either the global origin, the wing geom itself, or the fuselage geometry. But make sure that your plane of symmetry is correct about the correct reference. So. That is how we can go about modeling um, wing and a fuselage. I know we didn't really go into a lot of the details on how to exactly fit everything. And since we have a little bit of time to go back and look at the fuselage some more, I want to show you some behaviors of skinning. So in the time that we have, I'm going to bring the background back up and I'm going to go to that side view just so that we can... Um, demonstrate a little bit of skinning and how we can do this. So let's jump to a left view, try and set everything up to have an okay zoom level. And you know, it doesn't have to be perfect, but let's just demonstrate what we would do. So I'm going to go ahead and hide these two components and then jump to fuselage and we'll come here to say cross section one. Now, you can see down here on the bottom that we're kind of matching what we want, but let's come to the General tab, give this maybe a few extra cross sections, and then let this have some more interpolated sections in between this and this point. Now, we can kind of see that we're missing out on some of the details here, and we certainly aren't capturing the top of the cabin here. So we can either add a new cross section here and then move everything over, or we can try and just approximate it as best we can. Let's come to skinning and just see what we can see. We know that the top and bottom aren't going to be exactly the same, so we can deactivate top and bottom symmetry, and that gives us control over our angle, slew, and strength parameters. So let's start with the top and go all the way back to the point at our first cross section. We see that it's set to 45, maybe let's bump this up to 90 but that might have been a bit too strong, but the point is that we can just back this off a little bit. So instead of 0.37, let's make this down to, I don't know, about 0.2. Maybe that's not enough, 0.3. Okay, so we're starting to get there. If we come to, let's just go ahead and set this nice and even so we keep our right and left. And now we can start to adjust the strength on our top side. So strength is going to push this out further and further. And there's a nice talk on skinning that explains exactly how all this stuff works in detail. But this is just a quick demonstration on what some of them do. So you can give this just a little bit extra down here on the bottom. We can give this a little bit more as well. And you can see that we're starting to capture some of this shape. If we really wanted to do it right, what we would do is add a cross section here because there's obviously a, an inflection point and then you can set angles and modify as this goes around. So back here at the tail, let's go to this cross section. We're gonna adjust its position in X by dragging this back a little ways to say here. 
and we're going to go to this cross section and we're going to raise it up in Z. So once we have this all set up, we're going to give this maybe some more points back to skinning. And here, let's start playing around with the angle a little bit. So again, turn top and bottom off. And what we're going to do is adjust the angle. So in this case, you can see that changing the angle is going to change how that feature line passes through that control point in the model. And the trick is here that if we know we want it to be zero on the left, but slightly different on the right, we can turn off this equal sign. And now we can have this be only controlled on one side. So if you happen to know that it's a discontinuity in the angle here, you can set those to be unequal and, and let it ride. So again, you can adjust your strength, piece everything together as needed. But you can see how if you were to add a cross section here, control your skinning on the top and bottom, and you'll do the same thing for the left and right. It's just a trick of trying to get the closest approximation to this surface using as few control stations as possible. Because you don't need to go in and put 25 different cross sections in here. You just need to have maybe three or four stations where the geometry starts to change and use skinning to accomplish the rest. And you're going to get a much smoother surface and a really representative surface if you approach it that way. So hopefully uh, that explains a bit of basic modeling and how to manipulate wing geometries and fuselage geometries, how to adjust your skinning, and some things to watch out for when you're doing things like vertical tails, adjusting dihedral, etc. The basic modeling tutorial in the ground school goes into a lot greater detail and walks you through how to build up that 737 model. So if you want to see a lot more detail on how that's done, by all means, go visit the ground school and watch the step by step. Uh, and uh, with that, we've got about uh, 15 minutes or so and still until we start the next presentation. So I'm happy to answer any more of the basic modeling questions that you might have or give some demonstrations of a concept if you like. Uh, while we start getting set up for the next presentation. Thanks, Brandon. Uh, we've had some uh, good random questions on both the NASA and the YouTube uh, chat list that weren't necessarily related to basic modeling, but we've, I think we've got those answered. I'd like to welcome anybody out there uh, who has any questions about basic modeling to uh, type those into either one of the formats now, and we'll, we'll forward those to Brandon so you can address them. And while I'm at it, I'll go ahead and look at the social Q&A and see if there's anything that uh, I can answer directly while we're looking at this. Let's see here. Uh, someone just asked how to get the correct tail angle without adding extra cross sections. Okay, so so uh, I assume that means the correct tail of the fuselage, for example. I I would think so. I think if you, I mean, you might go a long way by just making this uh this model match. Uh, the tail angle, there you go. Yeah, so let's go ahead and take a look at the fuselage that we've already built up. And this example file is on the ground school. This is the exact same thing that you will download uh, if you were to go to the ground school and get the tutorial files. Uh, while I'm at it here, I am going to see if I can adjust the zoom and get this to be just about right on. And uh, we'll see if maybe we can't get this just right. Okay, so on this fuselage, you can see that we've got our skinning and our cross-section tabs. Let's go ahead and go all the way to the tail. Now you can see in this cross-section in particular, it's already got a, a, a vertical flat section on the top, but it starts to cup up just a little bit here. So in that case, in the cross-section tab, you're going to give it a little bit of Z offset to line up your dimensions with that outer mold line. And then back here, we have another cross-section that's basically the closure 
of the fuselage. So you can see that the height on this is actually quite a bit smaller than the one prior. And to make this a nice watertight component, we've closed it with a point. Now here, this is all rounded off, but if we go to skinning, we've got the bottom side set to minus 20, and that's just to try and loft this line down in a nice gentle curve to match what's going on here. If we come back to cross section four, you can see that we've got this set to a minus five degree angle. And really, it's just a game of picking the angle that seems to follow this curve the way that you want to go. And then you can adjust the strength. So for example, if I didn't quite like that this, was, this had some extra space back here, I could give this a little bit more strength. And you can see that I can kind of push it out just a touch more by adjusting strength rather than dealing with any of the angles. So you can kind of slide this around and move these until you get a really, really nice match on your control surfaces. And while I'm talking about it, let's go ahead and take a look at this because this is usually a decent indicator on how your model is behaving and whether or not you need to either give a different angle or adjust some of the strength. Notice as I adjust the strength on the bottom side here that these interpolated curves and these stations as I move along either bunch up or they clump together and push out. Okay, so I just did that on the right side. And let's say I did that by accident, which I did. You can either go to edit and undo parameter change or simply press control Z and it will reset the last change that you did. And that's a handy little feature to have. While I'm on it again, uh, OpenVSP does not auto save. So it's important to save your model while you're working. We've got a nice presentation about using Git to do version control and save your backups later. But for the time being, just realize that as we're adjusting the strength of these, you notice that you get closer and closer. You can actually set this to zero. And that's taking all of these sections as you move back and it's slamming them up against this cross section. And that's gonna cause you problems down the road. If you need something to have a zero strength, um, a zero strength skinning loft, it's a lot better to just deactivate it entirely. So if you just turn off set, it's going to do a direct linear loft in between these components, and you can see that there's no motion, there's no you know smooth lofting. If we move this around, this is just a straight line from here back to here. So again, if we press R and center this and kind of move it around, it's still not bad, but there's no you know elegant smooth skinning going on. It's just drawing straight lines and it's smashing everything together. So you know, don't use zero strength skinning is usually the mantra that we go with. Uh, do we have anything else coming up? We got about 10 more minutes before the next presentation. Yeah, Brandon, we've had a couple of questions. Um, one that would be great for you to address, someone asks, assuming that you're designing a V-tail, is the sweep angle measured from the XZ projected profile or is the sweep angle measured from the plane of the V-tail itself? So the sweep angle in, in uh, any of your wing components is just going to be that line uh, along the, the leading edge relative to the uh, the geometry so it, like if we rotate it in dihedral or rotate it in y it would be like if you're looking at a normal view to the wing and rob if i'm misspeaking here by all means uh correct me but at least in my experience i think that's the way it behaves is it treats the sweep as if it's uh the component now i, uh, I yeah, actually I I, the answer in the way the question was asked is the second one it's measured in the plane of the tail itself um right the, the wing is swept back and then it's rotated to put in either the dihedral or if you rotate about the x-axis yeah and so we've got to thank you on that so i think it's uh, been understood good 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 we had another question that was pretty in depth and i'm going to try and address it um it's been asked on the nasa side i'll try and summarize it because it's a very long question and I think it's uh, probably asked by uh, Cal Weller. So the, the question is about some of the details of the skinning algorithm. Um, 
And how does OpenBSP differentiate between top, bottom, left, and right curves? And is it interpolated in the U value around the circle from zero to 0.25 like that? And um, I'll say that basically, yes, it is. The top, bottom, left, right are those, are, is specifying the quantity of interest at the, the 0 0.25 0.75 or, or 0.5, 0.75 and values. So at those quarter values of U, uh, it's mentioned what happens if you rotate that cross section, that section, what happens to the, um, if you spin it versus rotate it, I think what happens to the, um, to the, to the skinning. And I think that spinning and versus rotating about X will have different results. Uh, spinning, it should just take that shape and reparameterize it. So it just shifts where the zero point is in that U parameterization. And um, but it but it uh, and so what you may want to do is rotate and then shift back. So I'm assuming you're doing something like an engine inlet where you want to have a trapezoidal tilted inlet. Um, that then flows into a circle shape. And so in that kind of a situation, you may need to rotate the inlet in X and then possibly spin the, 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 the parameter back to where you want it. Um, in particular, in cases where the U value is very nonlinear, it's, it's squeezed in one part. I do think that skinning is going to be a challenge. It's going to be difficult to work with. So there may be ways to try and, and work around that. And I can probably, if you email me, I can probably uh, help you work through those. The way VSP does the skinning is, is we lay out that curve. So you can think of at a cross section, there's a curve in 3D space that exists. Um, and then what we do is we also build a curve for the first derivative of the surface at that location. And then we also build a curve for the second derivative of the surface at that location. And there's, of course, in front of the section and behind the section. So we'll actually have to build a first derivative curve in front of and behind the section if those are different. And of course, the first derivative in 3D space means that it's a vector. So it's a, it's a curve of the X component of the derivative, the Y component of the derivative, and the Z component of the derivative. And when we're skinning, we only care about the, the derivative down nose to tail. So that would be the um, the the V or the U component, the U or the V, whichever one is not around the circle. So <clears throat> what we do is we have X, Y, Z curves of the position, and then we have X, Y, Z derivative curves, and then we have curvature curves. And those curves at each end of a section are used to specify the shape. And that's what we then do the math to, to loft the surface between them. Um, so in particular, when we lay out a curve and we know at that top, bottom, left, right point, which are at the 0 0.25.5 and 0 0.75 points, we know the three-dimensional, what we want that vector to be, right? By specifying angle and slew and strength, what you're really doing is you're specifying that three-dimensional vector. And so you've got a vector here on the top and you've got a vector on the side, one on the bottom, one on the right. And those are actually then in a curve that goes around. So those are then spread out. And then what we'll do is we smooth that. We, we I think we actually do it simply linearly. I'd have to go double check the code. But for all those points in between, uh, from 0 to 0.25 to 0.5, we're going to linearly vary. So if the, if the vector points in this direction in 3D space at 0, as you move to 0.25 and it points in this space, we're going to linearly vary that vector and create a bunch of vectors all along. And so we have this, this we end up with a continuous specification of the derivative all the way around and that's what's used to loft and I, I know that that's a deep in the weeds answer but hopefully that's helpful